Uh, hi, everybody. Thanks for thanks for joining us. Um, looks like there's some folks just trickling in, which is um, always great. Um, uh, thanks always to um, to Angela and to Emily and the, the folks at Venture Cafe for arranging um, tonight's talk. Um, look forward to it. Um, one um, sort of small but really important save the date. Um, and I'll talk about this in a second. But um, Ada, we'll hear from tonight, is a, a artist who will be part of the Philadelphia Open Studio Tours 2020, happening in April 2021. Think of the Olympics keeping their 2020, even though they're happening in July. Um, so we've done the same. So post 2020, in April 2021, we'll be online. Um, you can um, you be able to hear from more from Ada and about 200 other artists um, throughout Philadelphia. Um, every Wednesday evening in April, so it'd be April 7th, 14th, 21st, 28th, uh, from 6 to 8 p.m. Hope um, everyone can join us. Um, if you go to uh, philopenstudios.org, um, and I'll ask Natalie, our, uh, our trust intern, she'll put that link in the chat. Uh, but if you go to our website, there will be info um, coming there probably in the next couple of weeks about how to register for free tickets. Um, there'll be a digital guidebook um, and you know, profiles in each artist. So um, hopefully everyone can come back um, and join us with that in was that six weeks or so. It feels like even though it snowed today, like April is not that far away. So um, hopefully everyone can come back and join us. But um, tonight, um, it's really my pleasure um, and honestly my pleasure to introduce um, Ada Trio, like I said, a, a post-2020 artist and a current um, SIVA visual, Art, visual artist fellow um, she lives here in Philadelphia, um, but is native to the Juarez El Paso binational metroplex. Um, she focuses on she focuses on borders of inclusion and exclusion as they're experienced through people in forced prostitution, climate and violence related, international migration, and longstanding borders of race and class. Um, her work is in the permanent collection of the Philadelphia Museum of Art, and she's been her work's been featured in the Guardian, Vogue. Sony Magazine, Mother Jones, and it seems like half my um, half of Siva's Instagram posts are featuring Otta's work from local museums and international um, publications. So um, it's it's been really great to kind of see her work really kind of go all over her you know, really important work. So um, she's exhibited her work nationally, and internationally, including um, New York City, Luxembourg, Italy, Germany, um, and as Angel said, I'm going to ask folks to put questions in the chat. Uh, we're going to leave um, really encourage kind of um, we're going to leave a lot of time I think towards the end for a, a chat and a conversation um, to kind of really get into you know the important work that that Ada has been doing and continues to do. But um, with that, I will turn it turn it over to you, Ada. Hi, thank you for inviting me here, uh, Siva and Angela. Um, I'm going to share my screen and talk a little bit about my work. Uh, the host disabled the participant screen. Okay. It should work now, sorry. No problem. Mm. We have a problem. What is it saying? It's not giving me the option uh, to see it with my notes. Oh, do you have two monitors? No, I have one. And what I, the one I use is a uh, share portion of the slides. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that usually happens with PowerPoint if you don't have two screens, but if you want to go ahead and email. The uh, Michael has it. Okay, so why don't you have Michael do the presentation and then you just talk. Yeah, okay. Okay. Ah, where are you? Hold on. Sorry, I'm getting used to, I, I can't see the people, I can't see where the screen is. Oh, there you go. Okay, there you are. Okay, so are we in the first screen? First uh, image? Pardon, sorry. Are you in the first image? Yep. Okay. 
I'm a product of the US-Mexican border. I was born in Texas, but my home was in Juarez, Mexico, where I live with my parents. As a teenager, I traveled back and forth from Juarez to El Paso, so I could attend school in, El in the US. I was very lucky. Memories of watching immigrants crossing the border to the United States both inspired me and haunted me since my childhood. For the past five years, I've dedicated my life to documenting the crisis at the US-Mexican border. But for me, it was equally important to document the journeys to the border because many people never make it. One of the biggest questions that I feel after doing this body of work is, which is also um, a, com a life commitment. You do different chapters, but the commitment is something that I'm committed forever. It's my roots, it's where I'm from. One of the biggest questions that I, that I found was, what is our duty to strangers? And I feel this country is really divided right now, especially with the issue of immigration and people are scared, especially immigrant communities. Uh, and one way was uh, that we could do something for strangers uh, was to vote for a better world. But uh, another way is how we treat others, even if we're tired and we see somebody that we know doesn't speak proper English, that it, it might be an immigrant or something. How do we greet them? Do we make them feel like they belong? Or do we make them feel excluded? And how, how is that shaping our country? We have to think that this, uh, that we're all immigrants in this country. We just came at different times. So we go to the next slide. I have spent countless days and nights traveling alongside those I photograph to record their stories and amplify their voices. These are not people moving to another country for a better life. They are fleeing for their life. The people I met are not rapists and murderers, like our former president said. They are children, mothers, fathers, and even pastors with incredible gifts to humanity and great potential to this economy. How we treat people at our borders and those trying to reach our borders is a true test of our character, not just our policies. Uh, here, I will show you coming up a video that I took of uh, the project I did last January. I traveled to San Pedro Sula, Honduras. I wanted to do a caravan from beginning to end. Um, I've done three so far. And I, I wanted to gather like everything, all the data from beginning to end. On, uh, San Pedro Sula is one of the, the cities, the most violent cities in the world that is not currently at war. Their crime rate is really, really high. Um, it was about 4,000 people and they got divided. We met at the central station and there were two groups. One left on the 14th at night and the other one left in the morning, the following day. The Trump administration told the Mexican government that if they were all gonna allow for the safe passage of migrants into their territory, that they were gonna increase the tariffs of Mexican goods coming to the United States. So the Mexican government deployed it, the, the Guardia Nacional, which is composed of federal, naval, and military police to um, basically put the migrants into buses and deport them, uh, violating their human rights to seek asylum. So now we can watch the video and then I'll, I'll continue with, with the rest of the project. Thank you. 
Do I have it? Michael, can you unmute? <laughs>
The reason is you see, um, this video I showed it, that, um, I showed it before at universities at, at Center Santa Fe. And the, one of the main reasons for my work, the core, is uh, to inform. I do believe that the majority of people are good. They just don't know. They don't know the facts. They believe absurdities. And those absurdities uh, cause atrocities like the ones we just saw. The violation of human rights of Central American and Mexican migrants have been on the line in a horrible way. And they, people have to know about them. Now with the Biden administration, we have hope that things will change, but we still have Trump appointed judges like Drew Tripton from Texas that blocked the Biden memorandum and started deporting people, even though he, uh, like he went against Biden's uh, wishes that it was no people deported for a hundred days. So we have these problems. Are we in this next slide? Sorry. No problem. The one after that, that's the video. So during the chaos, uh, that was just horrible to see how the military treated. Uh, the migrants. It was just like you saw. Um, there is a clause in U.S. law saying um, it's based on non-reflourishment, which means you can't return a person back to a place where they face serious threats to their life or to their freedom. It was based on after uh, World War II, the great nations of the world united and said never again. This is not happening. And they created laws to protect refugees. Donald Trump violated those laws uh, and violated laws that also were part of the US, like the 1965 Immigration and Nationality Act. My friend Banda is very likely that he's dead now. He was the first, I was a heavy smoker, I admit it. Uh, and Banda was the person that sold the single cigarettes to the caravan. So we became really close, really fast. And when I saw him in the midst of the shoes everywhere, uh, military, everything, he was in a little corner shaking and crying. And I don't take those type of pictures like when, because he was completely broken. Just, I have not seen something like this because he knew he was gonna be killed as soon as he arrived to Honduras. The, um, this caravan did not have an opportunity to ask for asylum because they crossed into the country illegally. So they were not given that opportunity. Next slide. Why social justice? Next one. For me, the issue of social justice was uh, part of my upbringing and it was to be expected. My grandfather used to say, when you're born into privilege, it is your responsibility and your duty to help others. He was a great example to me. He was a physician and a businessman. During the day, he worked at the hospital. And at nighttime, um, for, the farm for the farm workers in, around the town that could not afford medical care, he would see them at his house for free. So when I went to visit, there was always a new chicken 
or new or fresh crops uh, that had been given to him as a thank you for his help. And my aunts follow his footsteps. So one of them started El Colegio de la Frontera Norte in my hometown of Juarez, dedicated to the scientific studies of um, migration issues. And the other one dedicated her life uh, to promote education for all. And basically the motto was, um, whatever your gift is, be of service, do something for others. Don't just stay there. Let's go to the next one. Uh, from my earliest memories, art has always been my passion. I painted until I was 38. And even though I was good at the technique, um, I just could not figure out a way to connect social justice with painting. And my heart and the brush were just not connected. So I stopped and at that time, uh, my ex-husband took me to Africa and gave me a camera. And it was the first time I, I had one, I touched one, and I started taking pictures of animals in the Jeep, and I wasn't too fond of it. But it was when we went to the Garok Festival in Papua New Guinea that I fell in love with people. I'm extremely shy and very introverted. But when I'm photographing and when I'm meeting new communities, a part of me that I don't know comes out and I'm curious and I wanna learn more about people. So I wish I could tell you that it was travel photography that led me to the work I do, but it's not. It, it was basically rage and indignation towards my people that led me to documentary photography. Uh, for me, the projects I choose are extremely personal. Um, I choose very carefully the communities I want to photograph. There has to be a connection. There has to, the work has to mean something, say something, and there has to be an object, objectivity to create some sort of change with the work. Otherwise, I'm not interested because I'm going to lose interest and I don't want the same thing to happen with painting. Excellent. So my first project was documenting Train La Bestia. Uh, it has several names, uh, Tren de los Desconocidos, uh, Train of the Unknown. Um, but basically the monster, and basically this train, if you see the map of Mexico here, it'll take you from the first station, which is in Arriaga, Chiapas, border with Guatemala. So as soon as the Central American migrants cross into Mexico, they take it. This is a freight train, just meant for goods, not for people, okay? Uh, and in 2014, the rules became even stricter uh, on not allowing uh, passengers in. So what happens is that uh, both the conductors and the police uh, ask for money from the migrants if they wanna continue their journey. And then, this uh, train will take them to the towns, to the border towns of uh, Mexico and the US. So if you think about it, a coyote smuggler will charge you for the trip between seven and $10,000. You're fleeing extreme poverty, uh, you can't afford that. So if you have no money, uh, that's your option. There are uh, between 10 and 15 trains that are interconnected and you have to switch trains in order to get to the border. It's not like just one shot. Um, and unfortunately, a lot of the women in these trains get raped. So one must take uh, birth control pills beforehand, uh, just in case. And these rapes uh, many times come from those people that are supposed to be protecting them, like the police. 
And I had a really bad experience with that. So I had to stop the project. I started in Arriaga and I had to stop the project in Lecheria, which is the middle because of that. And I can answer to that more in q and I'm gonna continue with this. If we go to the next slide. So here we see the terrors of what the cartels do to migrants. So we had in 2010, the San Fernando massacre, 72 uh, migrants killed and buried just uh, in, the, in the land by the cartel. Here in the case of Miguel, uh, what they do is they ask for a phone number. And the phone number is either a person in the US or a person um, in their home country. And they'll ask for approximately $1,250. That's the average. This is not done. Uh, the consequences are very severe. And here we see what the consequences are. Like in the case of Miguel, he didn't wanna put his family in jeopardy, financial jeopardy. So to teach a lesson to the others that were kidnapped as well, they cut off his hands. As many as 20,000 migrants are kidnapped every year in situations like this. And according to the Mexican National Human Rights Commission, this is a very lucrative business for cartels as they make up to $50 million. So when you think of the remaining Mexico policy, think of this. Next one. In La Bestia, I met Alan, and he and I became good friends. He made it to the United States. Uh, he's, his goal was to reunite with his mother. So he arrived to the United States and was within hours detained, put into custody, and then deported. But the following year, if we go to the next one, he calls me, well, through Facebook Messenger, which is a very good way of me to keep contact with, with the people I document. Sometimes it's Instagram, sometimes it's Facebook Messenger, sometimes it's WhatsApp, whatever medium. He sends me a picture of the caravan is, is departing Honduras and invites me to join them. So I did. And there I met Fer. Fer is actually a girl but to protect herself from the dangers of the journey she disguised herself as a boy and she's also an unaccompanied minor that was raised in the streets she was not allowed into the united states and was sent back to honduras and now is on a journey trying to get back to the united states This journey, I met with the migrants in, for this caravan in Tapachula. So Alan sent me the, the information and by the time I did the logistics, the plane and everything, they were in the border between Guatemala and Mexico. And I arrived to Tapachula and I did not know if they were gonna be able to cross or not. Uh, the Mexican government didn't let them in. They broke the gate, but there was, because of Trump's um, things that he said that they were uh, murderers and terrorists and all sorts of things of the government. It created this uh, huge amount of human rights watch. It got uh, every uh, major uh, channel watching them. So the Mexico had no option but to let them cross and, let, and, and, and go in. So uh, that's where I started my journey in Tapachula. And from there, we went to Tijuana. So it took us a month to get from Tapachula to Tijuana. So that can give you an idea of the distance. And if we go to the next slide. And once arriving to Tijuana, this was like a moving city. It's close to 7,000 people. Uh, 
So when we arrived to places, it was sleeping at parks. If we got lucky, like in Guadalajara or Mexico City, it was at the stadium, but mostly parks. And, uh, the city would put porta potties, and then we relied on like the food that people were giving because of their kindness of their heart uh, to others. Here, I met Diana in Tijuana when we finally arrived. And I was very sad to see the conditions in which the migrants were treated. There was no uh, formula for babies or very little. 50 porta potties for this amount of people leaking, kids barefoot. And I was just in a really bad spot. And she waved at me and said, are you gonna take my picture? I'm the princess. And at that time, she, she, it clicked. It's not about me, it's about them. She needs to be presented with dignity, with respect, with her dream. She managed to get the dress from the donation box that day and she grabbed it. It wasn't given to her because the other little girls wanted it. She grabbed it, it was her turn. So that gave me a glimpse of hope. And then we go to the next one. The next day, Thanksgiving, I meet Estela. And this is very close to the San Isidro border. Basically passing these uh, police, you see the San Isidro border. That is uh, the point of entry to the United States to, the San, to San Diego. So when a per, an asylum seeker is gonna ask for asylum, they the, one of their options is to turn themselves in a point of entry. The Mexican government is not letting them do that under who's, um, who's telling them not to do that. Are they doing it just free will? Or is the Americans telling them not to let the migrants in? So then we go to the next one. And this is a good story. And I wanted to include it, not just give you sad stories. I met Javi in Tijuana. Javi has Down syndrome and her problems. He was coughing blood the, because he was in the Benito Juarez shelter, closed for unsanitary conditions. And he's now in the United States uh, in the process of getting asylum, was started the process is safe and won a special Olympics medal in his local school. And he's learning and he's healthy. So this shows that it is possible. Next one. This was in October of last year. And I wanted to document what is a caravan under COVID. So I flew to San Pedro Sula, Honduras again. And I started with the caravan that departed in October. This caravan did not make the past Guatemala because of COVID and foreign policy. So they're here, I, the, those that managed to like get into the country were soon stopped by the military and turned back into Honduras. So this is what caravans are looking right now. If you see a caravan, this is the outcome under COVID. And then we have my favorite spot, I have to say. La Casa del Migrante. As I mentioned, I'm from Juarez. And I started working in La Casa del Migrante five years ago. They gave me an opportunity to, to get there and, and start working. But when I started working there, I shoot usually with two cameras. It, it, the, first, the, brave, the first brave kid came over and it's like, ah, can I borrow your camera? Like, uh, and I was like, am I here to give or am I here to take? What's the purpose of me being here? So I started this uh, little program where I teach the photography, the teenagers and young adults because um, they have no access to school and they're only there for three months. 
Here in one of the desert storms that we happened to have, I met Ismael. And I was with, uh, we, they told me, oh, come here. I went to the church, now realizing that that was the male's dormitory. And there were like 200 guys in that dormitory and it was pitch black. I only had my lantern, like my phone light and my flash. And believe it or not, they were all trying to figure out how I could take the best pictures with those two light devices. And we were trying to calculate how and who hold who. And it was just, it's, people are sometimes scared of poverty and they associate it with violence. And they're, they're, not, they're not together, they're separate. Sometimes they happen to overlap, but they're separate. Oh, I forgot to tell you. Um, Ismael uh, was, is um, one of the few Mexican people that, um, that I've documented that is not Central American. And he got deported after being 10 years working in this country uh, and serving this country. He got deported because he had a broken tail light. And um, he was trying to get an asylum claim because uh, he was being, uh, he, he was, the reason why he went to the United States was because he was avoiding the narcos of Michoacan. And then we have this other beautiful story of asylum, Azucena, uh, which we celebrated her 15th birthday, which in Mexico is a great Mexican tradition. And unfortunately she didn't, it was her dream to have a quinceanera, but it wasn't the quinceanera she dreamed of. It was in a, the shelter. The migrants happened to be the guests. But it was a beautiful collaboration of a bunch of people that made her dream come true. From the local seamstress uh, to a person donating the shoes, the food. It was just a beautiful collaboration. And then we have the other pictures and we're almost, I'm almost done. And these are pictures that my students have taken. So I'm there with the pink. Uh, Dennis is the recipient of the last camera, a boy with Asperger's, uh, who's now taking pictures at the local church in Juarez. And then the next, uh, I know this is a studio visit, but my work is right now at the University of Oklahoma on display. So I decided to give you a shot of, of, of how, how it's displayed and how it looks. And the other one is from the show I had in St. Joe's. And what I do a lot is I take, um, I have a journal where the people write in this journal. And sometimes I have picture and, and letter together that I can't use I can't use the image because the person might be at risk uh, from uh, violence, extortion, what have you. So I have a letter that I will read to you in Spanish and hopefully somebody can translate it. Uh, I'm gonna make this bigger. Nos venimos porque yo sufrí una violación por cuatro tipos Yo regresaba de mi trabajo cuando me violaron y luego me amenazaron que si denunciaba la violación a mis hijas las iban a matar y a todos. Por eso no denuncié lo que sucedió el 18 de febrero. Y luego el 18 de mayo nos persiguieron dos tipos y regresaba de hacer despensa cuando unos hombres nos persiguieron y gracias a Dios no nos alcanzaron. Y nos gritaron que iban a violar a mis hijas y matarnos a todos. Que mis hijas estaban en la escuela, las querían amenazar y que se fueran con ellos. Si no, si no las mataban a ellas también. Sufría cada día la escuela la amenaza de las maras. No podían salir, por ese motivo nos venimos. And so these are the same type of stories where this person uh, got raped by four people. And then the gangs wanted to rape their, her two daughters, her two young daughters who I happened to meet as well. Um, 
and they did manage to get asylum in the United States. But these are but the stories you hear, the trauma you hear are, it's just horrible. And the policies we had under the previous administration were just completely inhumane because one of the daughters was separated from them because she was 18. So she's now considered an adult. They can't travel as a family unit. They separated them and then they sent her back to Mexico. Just a beautiful 18 year old girl. That's what happened. She got raped too in Mexico. So I'm really happy that Biden is now in, in power and um, that's it. That's all I have. Um, thank you, Anna. Um, I know Nat Natalie has um, some of these these links um, to some of these nonprofits and NGOs that you mentioned. Someone I think in the in the chat asked how how um, you know they could help. So um, Natalie will will put those in there. But um, we do have some time for for questions um, for for Anna. Um, and I know sometimes it, it takes a second for folks to kind of gather. Um, gather themselves and formulate your your questions or thoughts. But um, I mean, I, I had a question for for you out of that. You know, more just like from a, a practical standpoint, like how do you how do you make these journeys, right? You 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 say you know you fly to Guatemala and you meet up with you know friends you've made. But you know, what is it like for you as you know as a photographer as um, as a woman traveling by herself, I mean, wh wh what is that process like for you just to make this work? Um, it's very difficult. You have to like, you have to prepare yourself that you're gonna be hungry, that you're gonna, uh, the um, Honduras is tropical. So the heat is unbearable. So is Guatemala. You have to walk long distances you have to prepare what you know you have to know what you're getting into if you're if, if you're gonna there's two ways of, of of doing this there's the way that photojournalists do with agencies where they go take a few shots and then they go to their hotel and then there's the way i do it which is i want to gather as much information as possible and i want to really relate to the full experience so i can tell you better what it is and build those connections because when you build those connections you have a picture that is more personal and that touches people yeah but we, you know when you and i talked about this a little bit earlier right there's that um famous photograph of the march from selma to montgomery um you know 1966 i think that was um 64 um, and uh, the photographer and you know I'm, I'm like blanking on I'm looking at my phone because I know I looked up when you talk but um, he talked about almost the same thing of sort of living with you know those protesters and those marchers and having that embedded experience and you know and I think you know the work you're doing I think is is, is it feels like it's sort of physically bringing us along right and showing us this sort of the, the heartache of it and the the pain of it but then I think you also, you know, you show us these bits of joy, right? Like that it, it, it that this isn't a kind of a, a one-sided issue um, as, it's, as it's often painted in, you know, the, the media coverage we see here, here in the States. And that's what I wanted. I wanted to bring like, it's like the truth. You know, I'm not hired by an agency that's either for the left or the right. I'm completely like neutral. Well, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but um, well, I I believe what I believe, and I stand for what I believe. But if I was working for an agency, perhaps that was for a, an NGO, like you can't show certain things. You have to have an agenda. You, you know, with this, I can show everything. Um, can you talk a little bit more about about some of the the NGOs um, you work for? I mean. You, you you spoke a little bit more length. Um, you know, we spoke a little more length about you know uh, the work you've done there, but also I think ways that people you know can can help and support um, you know, the on on the ground nonprofits. So I work with two people: the Minority Humanitarian Foundation, 
They're based in the border between, I've documented two borders, the border of Juarez and the border of Tijuana. So the Minority Humanitarian Foundation, uh, that's a really cool thing because they work in both sides. They work in the Mexican and in the American side. And they provide uh, legal help. They provide housing, well, housing, like they pair uh, people seeking asylum with a, with a person, with a host family. They really take really good care of uh, those seeking asylum. Um, so that's one, one, one group. And they do a lot for the LGBTQ community, a lot. Um, and then you have also uh, my second home in Juarez, which is La Casa del Migrante. And they host up to 450 people at a time, depending. Uh, and with them, it's because it's a Catholic run shelter, they can only host the people uh, for only three months. But they are, they are very, very poor. So they need like a bag of beans, always is welcomed. Uh, shoes because uh, the people that arrive come with like you no know, shoes, broken shoes. Anything you could give is greatly appreciated. And also, if you have a camera in there that you're not using, it can be text deductible if you donate it to the shelter. <laughs> um, so, question about you know what are you, what are your sort of plans now? Um, you know to to document future um, migrations and to see how and if things change with, with now the, the new Biden administration? That's one. I usually have like a couple of things that I'm work that I that I, I a couple of projects that I that I have in my head. Because if I have options, then it's likely the one will materialize. Um, so that's one option. But with COVID, is very difficult to document the, the caravans because they can't pass. They can't pass Honduras. Once they get to the border with Guatemala, there's no caravan. They're, they're sent back by Guatemala. So the, there's it's really like there nothing's happening with that. There is no outcome. They're stuck. What I am doing is I'm uh, documenting those that are uh, from the LGBTQ community. They have got an asylum here in the States. So that's something that new that I'm starting to do. So I wanted to do something like a little bit more positive with hope. I've done something sad. Now I need like something happy. And um, so that's that's something that, that I'm working on right now. Um, Jen asked about, you know, other you know, colleagues or um, folks traveling with you, you know, from the documented community, um, you know, both traveling with you, but also traveling and docking the caravan as well. No, I travel by myself. It was that the question. I, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't know if I understood it correctly. <laughs> but, but sorry, <clears throat> the question that I was asking is that if you're with the caravan, are there others documenting as well? I mean, are you? I know that you're traveling by yourself, but are there other members of the documentary community, or do you feel? Yeah, like when we got to Mexico, there were like flies. <laughs> Everybody was documenting there. So, but when we were in transit, leaving Honduras, no. So it, it goes in it goes in waves. Like they knew that something was going to happen. So if there was going to be like some meat, there they go. Uh, there's a, a a comment in the chat from RH, um, and it's in Spanish, and I can't read it. So I'll, I'll let you take a take a look at that and see if. Um, R.H. Levine, hace tanto tiempo, espero que todo esté bien contigo y tu espíritu de fotografías me inspiran mucho. Cuídate y hasta la próxima. Abrazo, suerte, Rafi. Y tus amigos inspiran mucho. Okay, no, just saying hi. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Wasn't sure, but didn't want, didn't want to miss it. Um, I just wanted yeah. to to say thank you for all of this work. And I know it must take such a personal toll on you. Um, but it's so important. And I know you mentioned in your talk that, um, you know, you had to, you had to leave one of the caravans. And I was wondering if you wanted to talk about that. It was with La Bestia, with the first project, with, La, with the train La Bestia. 
Um, I was almost raped by a federal police, Mexican federal police. And I managed to get out of it by luck, really by luck or by God or something. But it, it was really bad. I was alone with this guy. Uh, he puts a gun and he's like, you know what? I can do whatever I want with you. And one thing I know uh, by reading, by um, just I know, is that rape is an act of violence. And the easiest way to, to disarm your attacker is if you switch it and regain your power. So what I did, because I had no option, uh, was why don't you come to my hotel? I'll meet you later there. I smell bad. I'll get pretty for you. And I left. I, got, I managed to leave and get out. Thank you for sharing that. But I also met, one, one thing I wanted to mention, I also met a little girl, my daughter's age, that did get raped. And that was very painful. It, that happens. And it's the impunity of the, of, of the police uh, guarding the train that allows for those tragedies to happen. So I'm sorry if I'm being like Debbie Downer <laughs> with this talk, but I think it's very important that people are aware of the, the incredible sacrifices that immigrants uh, do to come here and they must, must, must be treated with the ultimate amount of respect. Um, well, thank you, Anna. Um, just kind of up on the time, if anyone had any sort of last kind of, you know, I think sort of a burning question, but um, I'll say that that is um, probably an important place to leave it. Um, thank you. Um, you know, thank you for doing this work. Thank you for sharing it. You know, thank you for, you know, yeah, thank you for sharing this work. Um, I know Natalie, um, appreciate, um, is going to put in the, in the chat, um, your email and your website and your Instagram. So if folks want to, um, you know, reach out to you and, you know, follow you and, and, and look deeper into your work. Um, Otto will be with us um, for post online um, in April. Um, she's in the, in the West, um, West group, that's sort of Center City West. Um, she'll be back um, on April 14th. Um, like I said, more info about that is on the, the post website. Um, that's, that's in the chat before, but, um, Thank you, thank you, Ada. Thank you, Angela, um, and thanks really everyone for for coming out and spending um, the evening with us. Thank you.